then if you ask, well, even the simple question like, how big is an electron? As far as we know, it's a point particle, which means it has no extension, has no size. How big is a quark, which is the other family of particles that make up our universe? They too, we think, are point particles, which have no extension. Which means that everything that is extended, every desk, table, top, or chair that you sit on, everything that's extended, is made up of things which have no size. Now, if you take two things that have no size and put them together, it still has no size. If you have a hundred things together, it still has no size. In other words, you can't pile them up and get anything. It still stays no size. But you, you have a table which has size. So there you go. <laughs> you know, they're already there at the simplest possible level of how do you have something which has extension and solidity. You know, it's not a function of the solidity and size of the particles. It's not like bricks that are being stacked on top of one another. It's a wrong picture. So what is this electron that has no size but has attributes? It has attributes, qualities. It has charge. It has what we call mass. It has, an elect it has a magnetic moment, so-called, and so forth. It has various quantum properties. But it's, it's, it, they're all located somewhere. Those properties are located somewhere, but their properties are an object that has no size. So you can't think of it like a table which has certain properties. It has no extension. It just has properties. It's, the, it's a location with properties. And then you have many of these different types of objects with, which have location and properties. And then they stand in relationship to one another. So these properties all form a kind of constellation of properties, of attributes, which form a whole, a kind of organic whole. And it's that that we begin to then interact with. Now you can begin to see that quantum physics and particle theory then begin to deconstruct many of the old ideas, classical ideas of what matter is, and challenge us to think quite differently about the way the world exists. And therefore, the properties arise in relationship. So what that means is rather than having objects out there independent of us, all of a sudden, the world becomes a place of relationships. Relationships, 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 everywhere. And if you try to get behind the relationships, it's, it's an illusion. The relationships themselves, you could say, establish being. You find this in some of the spiritual traditions. Um, for example, in Buddhism, they speak about codependent arising. It's a kind of mysterious language. That it's not the mind projecting and making a world, nor is the world there just purely objectively, but there's a codependence. And in that codependence, there's an arising of the phenomenal world. And I think this goes very much to the same point, that even from just a pure philosophical analysis, one recognizes that either extreme view is wrong. But there's a middle way where the world arises in a meaningful way, as in representations, this Geistige Vorstellungen, yeah, through relationships. So sometimes it's called a relational ontology. You know, that there's a, the way in which the world exists is through relationships. But those relationships are meaningful relationships, therefore sometimes it's said information, right? It's a, it's a world of attributes and locations. You could say it's information, and that that's what we should be satisfied with and not look for a matter, something solid behind that information. But we need to stand in a relationship to that information. That's the only way the information arises. You know, if you're standing on the, on the bank, of, on the shore of a lake, a very calm lake at night, and you look in to the lake, you can see the stars above. You're not looking at the stars, but you're looking into the lake. And I think oftentimes the formulas and equations and experiments of modern physics, which are complex and abstract and beautiful in their own way, are a kind of reflection of the cosmos in the lake, if you will. So you're looking down, you're looking into matter, and even through matter into subatomic matter, right? And you're going to see something fabulous because the whole world is of one piece, but you're seeing it in a particular domain. You're seeing it in the submaterial domain. So the, the formulas of quantum physics, for example, the theory of entanglement, as it's called, where a new kind of quantum holism appears, this is fabulous. 
It tells us very precisely, with mathematical precision, what it means to be holistically connected. It's not a fuzzy abstract. It's not a fuzzy feeling. You know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm holistically connected. It's, it's nothing new age. It's scientifically, experimentally verified. You can make machines out of this now, quantum computers. You can develop a whole new technology on a brand new state of, of matter. This entangled. So it's a, it's a fabulous development. It's mathematical and abstract, and yet it speaks about holism. From my standpoint, all the laws of nature, you know, I'd say, are expressions of a, of a deeper underlying spiritual activity. We, we read them as, as laws of nature, but in some sense behind them there are, there are activities of a spiritual nature. The very matter we're sitting on is a kind of um, sacrifice, if you will, that we can stand and s or sit in the, in the space in which we are. So you normally, in everyday life, you forget about, if you will, these kinds of realities. But if you have something like a Hubble Space Telescope photograph, where the beauty is so staggering and the scale is so enormous, and the time scales are so grand, that again, you come into that moment of the sublime where you can step into the experience and realize there is something not only present out there, but actually even around here. You know, and that you begin to see your own life in a different perspective by virtue of that simple photograph. Yeah, it is a, like a work of art, but the work of art is now one that's given by nature. And you sense that the, maybe there's even the hand of the master painter, so to speak, still present there which is in some sense another way of speaking about this activity that is beneath and within everything that's around us, including our own physical form. You know, when I was speaking about this, this world of spiritual activity uh, that's somehow behind the sense experiences, uh, I think at that level, already there's beauty, but it's a beauty which is unmanifest. It's not, it's not become sensually given. And then what nature does in some ways is to reach back and to lean into that activity and give it expression under a particular set of circumstances, a context. And in that context, here's the way it shows up. In this other context, here's the way it shows up. But the, the beauty, the source of it, you could say the harmony, the, the elegance, the grace of it, is, is given at a deeper level. And we see through the sense experience, through the beauty and the harmony, external harmony, and we sense that there is that activity in that presence. When you're listening to a great piece of music, you know, Mozart or Bach cantata or something like that, and you realize these are just sounds. These are just noises put in a row. You know, people opening their mouths in choral singing or something. How, but this is so amazing that you just move into the sounds and you realize it's not these noises that you're hearing, but you're hearing through the noises something deeper that transports you, you know. And nature has that possibility as well. You know, in some ways that through the arts we are able to also tap into, to, to move our way into that underlying beautiful rhythm of spiritual activity that's whole and seamless and in some sense is our origin and and dip back in and bring it into manifestation just the way nature does so yeah nature is in that sense an artist as Goethe said you know there's a great self similarity and as we become more and more people on the planet you know from 6 to 7 billion people to 9 billion people whatever it is and there's less and less nature then we have even more and more of a responsibility to do just that, to move back into those artistic sources so that we can nourish each other and inspire each other, even in the absence, very often, in an urban environment of the natural beauties that are around us. It gets harder and harder to see the sky. It gets harder and harder to find a forest. It isn't just a row of crops of trees, you know, but it has the actual order of the ecosystem still alive in it. And who knows how long we'll have them. So with the arts, we can always manage. We can do the arts. And if we do them authentically, I think they can nourish us in the same way that nature can.
as I said, everything from the laws of nature to the physical table in front of us, as well as to the human beings that we are, have multiple dimensions to them. And if we open ourselves through meditation to those dimensions, they reveal themselves. And that one dimension, one side of the story, will be the physical side of the story. And it will be, in some ways, complete. It, it will, for, every, for everything that's going to happen in the world, there'll be a physical story that'll be part of that story. But that isn't the only side of the story that needs to be told. There needs to be, as it were, an interior side to the story, a more subtle side to the story, another dimension that's opened up that's basically a soul-spiritual dimension, or dimensions, plural. So, um, carrying and embedded and embedding the, the physical is a much richer, supersensible and spiritual reality. Now, you know what the role of that worldview is. What you know how that relates to the intelligent design argument or the creationist argument, which is essentially a theistic argument. You're looking for an, uh, an explanation and, and a proof of God, right? Um, that would be a whole kind of conversation in itself, I think, where one would have to say, all right, I'm not interested in looking at 4000 BC that there was a, a, you know, a creation ex nihilo of the earth and all the people on it and the dinosaur bones in the, in the earth and so forth. You know, it's all just nonsense. But is there a way of understanding the cosmos which is sufficiently rich that the spiritual activity I was talking about is part of that cosmos and it has a differentiated forms, it has relationships at all levels so that the subtle levels are related to the physical level. How would that play out? What role does it play in evolution, if any? Um, how does it hang with the Big Bang Theory? You know, do these things happen all at the same time? I mean, there are many, many questions which I just do not have an answer to. So while I reject the creationist viewpoint. Uh, I also reject a completely reductive materialistic viewpoint as too simple and that we should really be open to an experientially based and cognitively oriented spirituality that has this multi multiple dimension to it. And that, that that kind of methodology will lead us to the answers to this kind of question. Mm -hmm. So again, the two faith traditions, you could say science as a faith tradition and religion as a faith tradition, they're the two poles, you know, they're going to be at battle on this issue. And I think the res resolution is not going to be by some kind of just simple compromise between the two. It's going to be by bringing in a whole new element, which I think is this experiential element of spiritual practice and a new kind of thinking that's suited to that experience. And I think if you look at the Waldorf School Movement as an example of one of the fruits of bringing these two together, you know, it's not so much that we get a new kind of automobile, new technology in that sense, but we get a new human technology, a way of educating, a way of doing medicine, a way of doing agriculture, a way of doing the arts. You know, these are our human expressions, and they are profoundly enriched by the union or connection between science and spirituality. So, um, in some ways, I think our future depends upon this connection. Uh, if the problems we're meeting, you know, are coming, whether it's from global warming and climate change or the energy issues and so forth, there are lots of bad solutions to these problems, you know, that are inhuman. Technically, they're possible, but they're inhuman. But if we have the full dimensionality of the human being in mind and we know both sides of our own nature, then we'll recognize the poor solutions from the, the genuine solutions, which enhance our humanity and benefit the planet, right? If, if you can make an error, does that eliminate all possibility of truth? Well, if it was, we wouldn't have science, because science is filled with mistakes, right? You only learn from your mistakes, but it, you get to recognize your mistakes. So it's more a question of how do you know when you're off base? How is it that you can discern the truth in the face of lots of sources of mistakes and error? And that's a whole interesting exploration in itself, right? Spiritually, now you're no longer in a community of scientists working with material methods. You're in a spirit. Say you're in a spiritual community of folks who are working with spiritual methods. How is it that community can intersubjectively validate each other, and how can each individual, in their own practice, validate themselves? You know, and there are methods. One of which is this method of self-knowledge. You have to know who you are. 
Otherwise, when you project, you won't recognize yourself. But if you do know who you are, when you project, you'll say, oh, there I am again. You know? I like the word delicate empiricism because it contrasts with the Baconian empiricism is the, is the key for Goethe. He knew Bacon. Bacon was a, a, a you might say, a more forceful empiricist, you know, pressing nature to give her secrets. Goethe was looking for a gentle empiricism, which was delicate in its character. Tate imperi. He says there's a delicate empiricism that makes itself utterly identical with the object, thereby becoming true theory. That's the, the line. So it's a participatory empiricism, which again goes against the normal science, which wants to stand back and be an onlooker. If you're going to come close to the natural world, if you're going to participate in it, if you're going to connect to it, then you do need to be gentle, otherwise you will project, otherwise you will disturb. So you need to slow down, calm down, become self-knowledgeable, in order that when you step towards the object to be known and unite yourself with it, you don't dismantle it and destroy it. And then you become true theory by that participation, to me, means that you see your way into that which is to be known. You don't, you don't reason your way analytically in, but theory in the sense of the Greek word, which means to behold. So one beholds the truth, if you will. One beholds the insight. But that happens through this participation in what it is to be, in what it is that's being studied. And there's a sort of theory of change, uh, personal growth and transformation there, where one, through participation and openness to transformation, creates organs of a new sort for perceiving. Jeder Gegenstand wohl beschaut schließt ein neues Organ in uns auf. You know, every object well contemplated opens a new org, opens an organ in us, new organ in us. That's a whole theory of of cognition there. So you, you, you give your attention, this again is a meditative kind of act, you give your attention to something, you sustain that attention, and it works back on you, informs you. Then you give your attention again in a new way, because now you have this new capacity, and it, gives, it informs you again. So there's this cycle of development that takes place. At the end of that transformation process, you have the possibility of actually seeing something new. And I think if you don't enter into that broader empiricism, then you're just seeing the old things. You're in that habitus, that, that habit of cognition, of seeing the same things that have been, you've been trained to see. Broaden the empiricism so that you're looking at whole ecologies and whole organisms and so forth. Pretty soon you'll start to see things you hadn't seen before. Right? You'll begin to notice connections and relationships which were not even visible to you because you were working with the molecular biological method only, and not a holistic method at all. So one needs all of these capacities, you know, and some people will have them stronger in one area, and some people have them stronger in another area, but I think to develop as rich array of capacities as possible by attending carefully to the world in its many, many characteristics, widely opened empiricism is the best. And not only amongst biologists, but also in the, in the mind sciences and psychology and the like, so the inner experiences that we have, and ultimately even the spiritual experiences that we have. And they're all self-similar, you know, it all has to do with attending well, wohl right? Look at it, attend well, then you change, and you see more. Every painter knows that, every artist knows that, but every scientist forgets it. <laughs> so now we need to remember. <laughs>